holding one of these beautiful guitars. But you know, um, in there on display is my first Nathan guitar, which my father bought in 1960. And um, yesterday on the radio, the guy at the ABC was really pressing Linda to talk about, you know, well, you know, every company that grows like you have are outsourcing. They're getting everything a lot cheaper from other sources like China and Russia and all that sort of stuff, and they're getting things made overseas and all that. And um, so what are you guys doing, you know, as if assuming that Maiden were outsourcing already, and, they, and they're, they're, they're not, you know. They build their guitars here with Australia, indigenous Australian woods. We, we do things our way here because that's what makes us different. And, um, you know, people are very, very quick to, to judge that. But uh, it just made me think that back, back in the mid-80s, I wrote a few songs and I did a bunch of demos and I got some free studio time because I played on some commercials for people who owned the studio and I got a friend to come an engineer and I recorded an album that I couldn't possibly pay for. I didn't have any money. And um, so I put these bunch of demos together and we made them sound as good as we possibly could. And then I went out and started playing solo acoustic shows and no one had ever done that before. Most people were either in a band or they were a singer. So I'm an instrumentalist and I was getting quite a crowd and I was drawing a crowd everywhere I played. And uh, so I plucked up the courage, I went to a major record label whom shall remain nameless, and, um, and I said to them, here's my album, you can have it, I'm not going to get an advance, I don't want money up front, I already paid for all this, and they, can you put it out? And they said, no, because there's no market for that, there's no one doing that, there's no market for it. And I said, if you'll just put it out, I will create the market. And the guy just laughed at me, and, and eventually he bent, he, he bent over, and I, I slapped him on the bum and said, come on, do it. And he said, all right. Um, so about a week later, uh, I got a call from a wonderful promoter who had put me up for the opening spot with John Denver in 1988. And he was playing the entertainment centres, he was playing to 15 to 25,000 people a show, and I was going to be the unknown opening act. This is a wonderful spot to be in. John Denver's audience are music lovers, people who come along to listen to good songs. So I came out there and blew a few people's dress up. They threw babies in the air, and next thing you know, my album came out. It debuted in the top 10, and the record company were suitably impressed. A couple of them had to have their brown corduroys on. Uh, and, um, but that's how things got started. But I'm telling you, it's the same principle. I had to build an audience by hand. And if you want to do what I'm doing, you're going to have to do it the same way. You're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to get out there and play your songs with all your heart and build your audience one at a time. You know, and um, people in places like Germany and Holland who come to my shows where I'm playing in the big theatre, 2,000 seats, right? And young people think I just came out of nowhere. I just suddenly appeared. Wow, I discovered you on YouTube. You're a new sensation. Wow. <laughs> they don't know that 35 years ago I was playing in some little dive in Amsterdam for no money, you know, for a drink. That's how I started. And people don't know about that stuff. The same thing in America. When I was playing around Sydney and I was earning some decent money, what I spent my money on was airfares. I used to fly from Sydney to LA. I'd get in, I'd go to the hotel, take a shower, I'd get changed, iron my clothes, ready for the show. I'd go down to the baked potato. I was playing two shows on a Monday night. I'd play my shows to 30 or 40 people and start to build it, and then the next day I'll be on the plane, Qantas plane, back to Sydney, back to the salt mine, you know? That's what I did to get started in America. Invest in yourself. That's the best investment. And that's how I, I started over there. And then 
it was my good fortune that my my idol, my my hero, Chet Atkins, called me and asked me if I wanted to record with him, and I was part of a Sony Music Showcase in Nashville in 1995, and that was the beginning of me uh, starting to make inroads in America. So it's been since then. Um, so what is it now? 2016. So that's uh, 20. 21 years of solidly going backwards and forwards to America. In the meantime, since 95, I've lived in San Francisco, LA. I now live the last 12, 13 years in Nashville. I've lived in London twice. I've moved my family. I've dragged them from pillar to post. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, and it's been such a great, a great journey. I remember all the early days in places like Italy where Maiden guitars were just getting started over there and they were so helpful to me. They put on, you know, in conjunction with music stores, we, we put on workshops and, um, you know, they, they, they got a lot of people along and I, I did, did my best to give them a great time and all that and I had an interpreter. And then I finally got on some bigger tours over there and all that and that's how it started. That's how it started for me, that's how it started for Maiden. And, um, yeah, that's just, you've really got to be there for the long haul if, if that's your commitment. Listen, what I'm doing is, is what, what I believe I'm meant to do and I just don't even question it. But it may not be the, the thing for you. You know, most people that, who come to a workshop or a masterclass or whatever, most of them are just trying to improve. You know, most of them just want to be inspired or see how someone else does something, you know. If you play just for the love of it, that's great, you know. If you get paid for it, that's a bonus, that's for sure. So if you want to play just because you want to back yourself singing, that's great too, you know. There's no judge and jury here. It's just trying to help people. And then that's really what it's all about. And as I said, I'm just an example to you of someone who makes a living playing the guitar and tries to do something good and positive in our world and because uh, when i play you get happy and whether you know it or not you don't think about things that are going on in your life when i've got your attention and when i'm slapping you about with my musical ideas that's all you can think of and your stress level comes down without you even knowing it it's a good job so i can highly recommend it any questions at this time yes sir uh, tommy how do you when you when you get a call when um, I'm right. When you record, record. What, like, what mic setup do you normally use? Um, and, um, like how has that sort of changed from oh, to your, your track? Okay. <laughs> this gentleman asked a very good question. He said, when I'm recording, how is my recording uh, way, uh, like mic setup and stuff like that, equipment, how has it changed? Well, actually, it's kind of regressed because when I, when I recorded only an endless road, I was using acoustic guitar plugged in to a DI and going through an amp and the amp was in a different room, it was isolated and then I had four mics on the guitar acoustically. So I had about 12 channels for one guitar. Wow. So I could find EQ and, and sounds that I liked and what, what we did is when we mixed the albums we would turn the mics so the mics put the guitar here and then we would put the reverb on the amp and sit it back behind that. So the sound of my guitar had depth of field and the reverb didn't get in the road of the acoustic sound of the instrument. But that's what we did. Now, have you heard my track, It's Never Too Late? Yeah. yeah. It's one microphone with nothing else. I went back to just doing that. And I'll tell you what, it was a Neumann 149, an old one. And Mark DeSisto, my engineer on that album, he has a microphone that I love so much. I first used it um, in 93 on my album, The Journey. I used it then, and I still use the same mic when I work with him. Because when you hire Mark DeSisto, he comes with that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the, the track, it's never too late. 
um, was the guitar before this one, the yellow mouse, right, the one with the really yellow face, um, with that mic on it. And I actually, his, uh, his wife went away for the weekend with their son, and so we had his house to ourselves. So he has a little mixing studio where he mixes all his the projects that he's working on. We decided to record there. So we, we just took the rugs out of the lounge room, went back to the wooden floor. I taped a pillow to my foot so I wouldn't bang, make a noise. Right? <laughs> and we recorded six of the songs for It's Never Too Late in his lounge room and with him in the, in the uh, mixing room around the corner. So it was just in his house. But um, I, I'm sitting with the guitar like this and, and he came out and positioned the mic and then he, he opened the, um, the phasing of the, of the um, uh, what do you call that? The, uh, like the cone, the, um, oh, the diaphragm. The diaphragm, thank yep. you. Yeah, he opened the diaphragm to a different thing to, to, to see what it was like. And when he hit a certain thing, I said, that's it. That's the one. Like that. He just opened that's the one, there. Tommy? Oh, that's the yeah. one there. Ah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Look. Yeah. From the Facebook. Yeah. Pass around. Akira san. Yeah. Thank you. That's Japanese right. technology. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there you go. That's the lounge room. That's the one mic. That's the guitar. Uh, you see oh, that? Wow. Can you see it? Yeah. Thank you, Akira. That's if you okay. want to see it again, yeah. you can always pay him $10 per year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, thank you, Rain. Okay. You're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> If I forget anything, I can just ask Akira okay, you know, yeah. or, or, or Dale. Or, or Dale. Yeah. yeah, and they remember everything better than I do. <laughs> um, so when I go senile, I'll be really relying on you too. <laughs> and you too. Oh, why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, so he turned, turned the diaphragm and, it, and just the sound just opened. And it just seemed like we had the absolute pure sound of that guitar. I didn't plug in, I just used one mic in that one position and it's one of the best sounds I've ever got. Yeah. 